Finally, on our way out of town, we saw flashing lights in a Geary tavern with an odd moniker, The Cave. Greeting us at the entrance was a Geary police officer in a Kevlar vest. He patted us down and directed our attention to the sign bearing the rules of the establishment. In addition to the standard, no shirt, no shoes, no service, there were admonitions against gang colors, bandanas, visible jewelry, the flashing of gang signs, and weapons of any kind. The bartender, a flamboyantly gay black man, welcomed us like old friends, taking her drink orders and immediately bonding with Roger when he referred to his geary childhood. The only other patron was a middle-aged woman who also joined in the conversation, playfully ribbing my friend because he, unlike her, graduated from Gary's inferior high school. We were soon surrounded by Gary residents and visitors, and it wasn't too long until the dance floor was full with patrons of various sizes and hues dancing along to Michael Jackson's greatest hits. Because we skipped dinner, Roger and I were beginning to fight off hunger pangs. As we settled with the bartender to leave, he thanked us for stopping by and added with a sardonic grin, if Michael Jackson could die every night, the bar wouldn't be in trouble. Gary's troubles began long before Michael Jackson's fatal drug addiction. When Jackson first learned he could sing and dance, and when my friend Roger came of age in the 1960s, Gary was thriving, a representation of America's post-war powerhouse status of industry. John Mellencamp pays rollicking tribute to the kind of men who broke a sweat and their backs in Gary's mills, even naming the city in Minutes to Memories, a song about an elderly man sharing with his son the hard-won wisdom of family, thrift, and work. Because Gary became a mecca of the steel industry, it promised stability and prosperity for many families throughout not only Indiana and Illinois, but also the Deep South. Many black Americans escaping the terror of Jim Crow and lynching and seeking suitable employment migrated to Gary. It was an emblematic epicenter of a secure middle class, resting comfortably on a scaffold of American hegemony, trade unionism, and manufacturing. At the height of Gary's success in the 1960s, boosters, local politicians, and cooperative journalists actually dubbed the industrial center Magic City. Merely two decades later, Gary took on the appearance of a small town in the weeks after a bombing raid. Magic City turned into a cruel joke, giving way to other descriptions in the press. The murder capital of the world, the most miserable city in America, and ghost town. In 1970, approximately 175,000 people lived in Gary. Now it is home to 66,000 residents, most of them poor. Few families, professionals, or entrepreneurs have any reason to live in Gary, especially when considering the proliferation of poverty, crime, and smog. Few people even have reason to visit. In 1993, after watching the city crumble and capture headlines for all of the wrong reasons, a celebrity with bags of money to throw around toured Gary, making promises and raising hopes. His name was Donald Trump. <laughs> 